Morning all. I'd like to explore a concept which some of you already expressed uh, some interest in uh, when, when I um, presented about critical positions detecting the vibes. And when lying in bed for the last four days with flu, um, it occurred to me uh, some parallel actually with uh, an area of computer science called uh, lazy evaluation. Um, now within lazy evaluation, um, it, you know, a very complicated expression seemingly. Uh, sometimes if, if you're saying that parts of the expression, if they're true and, and other parts, uh, they don't need to be um, sometimes worked out because you already know that the result's going to be true or, or false immediately without actually working out other parts of the expression. And it's called like lazy evaluation. It's in, in functional languages. So what has that got to do with chess? Well, it occurred to me, <laughs> and this is possibly, you know, kind of an outrageous idea, that critical positions in, in chess are those turning points where you're either going to suffer great damage to your position permanently or potentially inflict, you know, a great advantage, you know, permanent damage on the opponent's position. And um, it doesn't matter how hard you work after those great turning moments, uh, it's it's going to be you know uphill or downhill struggle respectively. Um, so basically, I, I have this idea. In effect, you're you're if you play the critical positions super accurately, somehow you find the extra resources, you find the extra independence of, of thinking uh, to find the, those amazing resources needed. Then what you're doing is actually. In a way, and I like this this catchphrase, uh, earning laziness. Um, not not that I'm ever I've ever been lazy myself in any aspect of my life. So this idea of earning laziness in chess, I'm basically saying that um, a lot a lot of the game you can play more more or less routinely standard simple chess, but on on the turning moments, the critical moments, that that you know you need to somehow find the resources in the position, you know with with greater accuracy, but um, the, the trick is not to exhaust yourself on each turn looking for the amazing stuff, to somehow sense that those turning moments more intuitively or develop your intuition for that. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to explore this concept of earning ladies with, with a series, um, but I also did want to video annotate some of John Piggott's games, um, who's currently on an ECF rating performance of 250 in the Hearts League with 5 out of 5. Having beaten recently, when I was at um, the London Classic, uh, I am Simon Knott of, of Hartford Chess Club. So we've got a comfortable draw in that match already with one game left to play. Um, but here is one of um, John Piggott's recent elegant wins, which might, in a way, it, it is also a demonstration of, of the idea that if you pick your critical moments to play them accurately, you can end up with with beautifully played games, which seemingly, you know, effortless uh, simplicity. In sim simplicity. So let's have a look at this. So this was against Bonafont. Um, so John Pickett, he John played d4. Philip played c5. So kind of check Bononi. So e5. But now e4 was played. Now c4 has been delayed, which means the bishop's got access to b5 potentially. So d6. So instead of c4, bishop b5 now, check. So that's maybe a start of a bit of annoyance for black. Black doesn't really want to give up the light square bishop too, too um, readily, because these light squares later are going to be uh, more exploitable. So knight d7 seems understandable. Now a4, okay. So black now plays a standard check but only plan bishop e7 as though the bishop's going to exchange off for this one. But now this this is rudely interrupted now with this next move f4 from John. So have we got a critical position yet? Well, it's becoming critical because um, some of the factors in the position. Look, look at this um, slow down queenside development. Black hasn't castled yet. Um, the potential for f4 pressure is there. So e takes uh, bishop takes f4. So now knight g f6. Can black just castle maybe play rook e8, eight, rook e8, and then sort of try and target e4? That's the question. Well, knight c3 was played. 
So C4 is definitely not going to be played. Uh, White is instead trying to use the dynamics on the F file and maybe D6. It's like Benoni structure with D6, a bit weak. So castles knight F3. Now rook E8. Ooh, looking stand so far, is White looking for anything super cunning here? I was witnessing this game next next door. You know, next door in inverted commas. It was a club match, and I was absolutely amazed at what happened very soon now. So white castled. A6 naturally like kicking the bishop and is the bishop going to go to d3 because is it going to be a target to c4 later? If black ever stretches out on the queen side maybe c4 is going to be a bit of a, a problem. But the bishop did go to d3. Bishop f8. So is black going to get away with this setup? He's got that semi-open file against e4. Potential for rook b8 and b5, b4 maybe. Okay, King H1, and now Black actually accelerates uh, this plan of, of B5 C4 by playing actually move C4 straight away. Now, in our critical moment detection, which I've hinted at in some of my games from the recent tournament, it's often after a pawn sacrifice, isn't it, by one of the sides that uh, or, you know that the, the dynamics change so rapidly in in the position. So, how does white earn laziness here? Um, there are certain critical factors which intuitively we can sniff from the position. Um, the first thing to note, though, is um, you know, does, does the bishop actually want to take that pawn, or can it go to e2? If it goes to e2, then black's going to take anywhere on e4 and end up seemingly protecting c4 anyway. So. John decides, okay, this, this move is, is more or less clear cut. Um, okay, I mean, you could, you could in this position also inspect other alternatives like e5, but taking ef, queen f6 would seem um, fairly harmless uh, for black. Uh, so bishop takes c4 was played. Okay, now here is where, you know, how many of us would be in routine mode? So knight takes e4. We recapture now. Surprisingly, in fact, so this this is the first critical moment. W how many of us would have the guts to, to surprisingly recapture like this? Because aren't we inviting the rook to double attack both bishops? That's that's the question here. This this is where amazing cunning is is at work here. So knight takes e4. So rook takes e4, seemingly allowing a very dangerous double attack on both bishops. So what had John had in mind? Had our like 229 ECF board one just blundered against uh, Philip Bonfont, who's like uh, 195 ECF? Well, this is what uh, we can call a completely critical moment. Um, I wonder if I give you 10 seconds, uh, <laughs> or you can pause the video if, if you'd like. Uh, can you spot what uh, you think John played here? Okay, 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. John played an absolutely shocking move, um, which I thought, uh, okay, is it, is it really, um, is it really working? Uh, he played knight g5. Okay. Um, so knight g5 hits the rook on e4, it targets also f7 and h7. So obviously this bishop on c4 is in pre now. So the question is rook takes c4, what would happen next? Okay. Or there's rook takes f4 with the idea if rook takes f4 there's queen takes g5. So both these factors, these tactical moves, obvious moves, needs to be taken into account. Rook takes f4, rook takes c4. Rook takes c4 we can quickly rule out because here, I wonder if you can spot in this position uh, a not a nice move which uh, is, is fairly clear cut actually um, and wins. If I give you 10 seconds here. Okay. I think in this position just queen 
d3 just wins the exchange hitting the rook and h7 um, and there's no h6 queen h7 mate g6 just take doesn't seem to be anything for black here we can we can engine check this position just to make absolutely sure that white ends up on top yes so knight f6 queen c4 is, is the ribka line okay so but this this other line is more 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 complicated the game continuation so knight g5 which had to be clearly worked out rook takes f4 john now continued uh the attack um with the move queen h5 so he's sacrificed an entire bishop and what has he got for it well intuitively we can see that the black queen side pieces are still underdeveloped f7 and h7 are real targets especially you know on this f file f7 is a major target area now i think black missed the most accurate possible response here checking with ribka which was actually um to sacrifice the queen with queen takes g5 because uh, now this forces the queen to come off the critical squares and then there's rook takes c4 and maybe you know black can hold on a bit longer here with a technical advantage uh, but this this requires uh, some careful play on black's part but in theory black's got you know three pieces for the queen but um, in the game and, and in, a different move was played h6 so we have now um, another very interesting move with the clear idea that if rook takes f4 queen takes g5 is surely going to be okay for black it will still be two pieces uh, and 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 um, for the rook and the attack st staved off surely well rook takes f4 was played but after queen takes g5 white well, does have that dangerous queen takes f7 check and after king h1 now in this position we have a quiet killer move i wonder if you can spot it so remember black's queen side is undeveloped underdeveloped but also there's a vulnerability of the black king side here and these light squares um e8 is a possible entry point if i give you five seconds here okay a solid central positional move quite in the midst of uh, seemingly sacrificial sequence rook e1 was played with big threats the knight's kind of pinned down anyway because of queen takes f8 if it ever moves b5 seemed like miles away because the bishop can't move because it's tied down to d7 there's the big threat now of rook e8 so uh, black's getting a bit uh, concerned here he tries to accelerate his queen side development. He plays b5. But now, instead of um, the routine uh, looking move, rook e8, uh, which which may actually, uh, well, it, it wouldn't work. If, if takes, it wouldn't work as well as the game. If takes here, though, uh, black's going to get some counterplay on the a file. So, so there's there's a few options um but john um in fact found a very very nice forcing move he played actually h4 kicking the queen back to an undesirable location potentially queen the eight rookie eight with tempo but um this this seemingly offers the weakness of the last move is the g3 square to attack this rook so that was played queen g3 but uh, this was all invited, you know, Queen G3 was factored in, because I wonder if you can spot John's next move here, <laughs> at move 21. So again, a critical, uh, all these critical turning moments just calculated in advance, actually, I believe, from um, the long, the very long thinking time John used when he had played Knight G5 back at move 15, believe it or not. And I'd witnessed all this, and it's, it's just an incredible game. To, to visualize all this like counter sacrifice and stuff and have this winning attack so I wonder if you can spot white's next move here if I give you 10 seconds starting from now okay 
with the queen side undeveloped, this queen sort of just uh, okay attacking this, but there's two pieces under attack now. Queen sacrifice, queen takes f8 check. So, two pieces, but now comes um, after king h7, bishop d3, which forces uh, a pawn concession, even if the bishop's given up, g6 is going to have to be forced. And then after that, rook e7 will be a mating net. <coughs> so here, black faces the terrible reality, he has to give up his queen. His g6, rook e7 mate. Uh, if we have a look at that, rook e7 is mate. Um, Bishop f5 just delays that position because the rook can still come to, to e7. So Philip gave up his queen, and now it's just all over really because this pin is pretty menacing with an immediate threat of rook e8 just winning more material. So uh, Philip decided bishop b7, just go the exchange down, but it's hopeless. Now just rook e6, and black's pawns are being picked off. Bishop takes d5, rook takes d6, 1 0. I thought, what a superbly elegant game. But if we have a look, how many of us would have played those critical moments with such amazing accuracy and independence of thinking of material or whatever? Just let go and, and play on the dynamic factors. That's queenside uh, lagging development. If we have a look at that game again. Uh, so a Shaq Benoni without white uh, bothering to play c4, instead throwing in this bishop b5 check. So as I say, John's the most feared player in the whole of the Hearts League at the moment. He's a player with two IM norms, and he's playing He's playing with great resurgence this season for both Barnet and King's Head chess clubs. So a 250 ECF rating performance so far in the Hearts League. I know only after like five games, but he had a huge rating performance last year as well. And also he, he's playing more in the North Circular League as well. So knight d7, um, and now this f4, so already a sharp breaking move, uh, breaking open that f file. So who would have thought that f7 becomes so vulnerable so quickly in this game? And white's accepting black's uh, trump cards, uh, in fact comes with like, the semi open e file and potential for b5, but uh, b5 is already slowed down anyway by that pawn on a4. Uh, so castles. So the bishop going to d3, and now this move, which, okay, Perplex is getting away from any queen b6 checks, which might have been handy for black. Black accelerates uh, to win this centre pawn, but the queen side is is the intuitive uh, factor which doesn't smell perhaps quite right, which would lead you know some of the stronger players maybe to to take time to maybe consider a dynamic um, idea here, which was played. Uh, which is mainly to give up um, a bishop, either bishop. So giving back the choice of which bishop do you want, I don't care. So uh, the so the bishop on f4 was taken more modestly rather than the one on c4, which 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 goes splat anyway because of queen d3. So rook takes f4, but still now a raging attack with the key element here being black's undeveloped queen side. So queen h5. I mean, it's a it's a bit of a masterpiece, um, and if I can get the game score for the for the other short win which John has had recently against uh, an IM, something like that, that would be pretty cool as well. So Queen H5, okay, the optimal defence not picked up on, but um, I think by playing these critical um, moments with with great accuracy, um, there's not only laziness for having to play. You know, moves in between, but also a sweetness and elegance to the game. That the game's going to be decided fairly swiftly uh, once these turning moments are, are capitalised on each and every one of them. Uh, so h6, rook takes f4, hitting that f7 pawn. So black for a moment stands materially better, but positionally he's he's been destroyed here because this powerful centralising move. Rook e1 with devastating threats like rook e8. Black's really tied down, so he tried to get his, his pieces developed, but uh, it's too late now because now there's queen sack lines 
coming into the, the picture. This next move, H4, by the way, the more observant you would notice, what it really did, well, as well as giving um, an escape square for the, for the king, potentially for back row issues, but remember, there's only black's queen lurking around at the moment on the scene, but it took the queen off the E7 square, which means the entry point E7 also becomes important in this line of the queen sacrifice. So a queen takes f8. The queen sack uh, means that um, bishop d3 and rook e7 are absolutely like winning. So bishop d3 check. A beautiful game, I, I, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and it's just incredible that uh, Barnet have such a strong plan now uh, le leading us in, in, in our leagues. Um, so bishop takes d5, rook takes d6, and that's it. So I think um, I, I want to try and elaborate more clearly, though, this, this theory uh, that I have, that if you do play the critical turning points, stiffen them out correctly in your game and spend the extra effort to find the amazing resources that might lurk there, then that makes, that makes it easier for you to play the rest of the game, you know, perhaps with more simple chess and inverted commas. Uh, so the notion that you can earn laziness, I think, is a very interesting notion um, through playing critical positions accurately. Uh, but I want to expand that concept with some further concrete examples from my own games. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.